What's the best amount of meals to eat for fat loss? For years and years and years, six meals per day, eight meals per day, more meals was better, grazing was better because it controlled your appetite. Then the pendulum swung the other way and we started talking like one meal a day is better because it keeps insulin lower throughout the course of the day. Well, what is it? Well, now we have a lot more evidence to look at sort of wide angle and see what's going on. So we'll open this up with one big study that was published in Advances in Nutrition. And it was a systematic review meta-analysis where it looked at 22 randomized controlled trials, 647 participants. It was a big meta-analysis, a big review. And they were looking at all kinds of different meal patterns. And what they found was kind of interesting. The researchers claimed two meals per day is, quote, probably slightly better for reducing body weight than three meals or six meals but it needed some more nuance there. And then what else they found was really interesting. They found that the difference between having one meal per day in weight loss and eight meals per day with weight loss was not statistically significant. Now, statistic significance is different from sort of reality, right? Statistic significance is basically measuring kind of almost the difference of what they expected to happen, like a different outcome. The mean difference was still over five pounds. It was about five and a half pounds between the one meal a day group and the eight meal a day group. Okay, so they looked at the big picture. People that consumed one meal a day ended up having about a five pound more weight loss than those that consumed eight meals per day. The one meal a day came out ahead a little bit in terms of body weight reduction, but it doesn't end there. Now the researchers did say, and I quote, that two meals per day was probably better than six meals per day for fat loss. But when we look at the big picture of it, one meal per day was ranked as the best frequency for reducing body weight, followed by two meals. Whereas two meals performed best for waist circumference. It tells us that potentially with one meal per day, there is some muscle loss that's occurring. Whereas with two meals per day, it improved waist circumference better. So you probably had some muscle preservation and overall the waist to hip ratio improved best. But this doesn't give us our answers because all this does is look at some body weight and waist circumference. It doesn't tell us like what is actually better long-term because you and I both know that really for long-term weight loss, long-term fat loss, we need to be looking at appetite. What is sustainable? So when we look at appetite, there's a study that was published in the journal Nutrition. And again, I'll open with a quote from this study because there's a lot to look at. Increased eating frequency has minimal, if any, impact on appetite control and food intake whereas reducing eating frequency negatively impacts appetite control. At first, this kind of makes it sound like eating less meals probably isn't good because it's gonna make you more hungry. No duh, Sherlock, like you're eating less, you're gonna probably be hungry and you're having longer periods of time between meals, you're probably gonna be hungry. But what was interesting was that increasing frequency above three meals did not really do anything. It didn't increase satiety to any measurable degree. But when you reduce the number of meals, it does increase your appetite. However, I don't necessarily see that as a bad thing because we have some mechanistic literature and other observational literature to demonstrate that when hunger hormones like ghrelin are elevated and you're a little bit hungry, that's actually when you're burning some fat. It's a necessary evil to get through. It's not fun to be a little bit hungry, but it's also okay to be a little bit hungry. Why is it that we feel like if we get the smidge hungry, we have to go eat? It's okay to be a little bit hungry. It's called hunger drive. It's kind of what makes us want to go hunt for food, right? We just don't have that situation where we hunt for food because we can drive down to our Piggly Wiggly and have whatever food we want the second that we have a smidget of hunger coming in. So I'm okay with having a little bit of hunger. It tells me that something's happening within my body. But what's interesting about this journal nutrition study is that increasing meal frequency did lower the peaks in what is called perceived appetite. So they didn't actually go and eat more, but they felt like they were less hungry when they were eating more meals. That's a psychological thing. But is appetite what you're after? Are you after being less hungry or are you after fat loss? And that's not a joking, like sarcastic question. That is real. Like fat loss is a little bit different from appetite. Appetite is probably sustainable for good, healthy weight maintenance. So if you're looking to just like survive and like have yourself at a healthy weight, you wanna pay attention to your appetite. But if you're looking for maximal fat loss, you need to see what actually works and look at the data regardless of when you're dang hungry, right? It's a tough pill to swallow, but it's reality. However, there was a study published in Cell Metabolism that found something interesting. They found that when subjects consumed 45% of their calories in the morning, 35% at lunch, and 20% at night, they ended up having significantly less appetite throughout the day than when it was flip-flopped. Having larger meals 
could work in your favor for appetite as long as you're having them early in the day. So by having a large bolus of calories coming in in the morning, 45% of your calories, you control your appetite throughout the day and you can get by with having less meals and allow insulin levels to get lower and potentially burn more fat throughout the day. Otherwise, you're allowing yourself to graze more at night. And there's literature to back up and reinforce that people that tend to graze on food tend to consume more calories at night. So the more fatigued I get, if I'm grazing and I'm more likely to get my calories later in the day, I'm more likely to screw up. Now I wanna get into the glycemic piece of it and what sequence and spacing of meals is best for blood sugar and insulin resistance. There was a study that was published in Diabetes Care. It had subjects go on like a short, little bit longer than an overnight fast and then had them do either two meals per day or six meals per day. And these were people that technically had insulin resistance, but they were not insulin dependent. They didn't need to give themselves insulin. What was interesting is that they found that they both responded decently well to their blood sugar spikes, but the people that had two meals per day had big, large spikes in glucose and then would come down. Not necessarily crash, but would come down. So you have to ask yourself the question, what is better what is worse, having two big swings and then coming down or having consistent little to moderate swings all day? I would rather have one or two big swings and come back down because one spike in blood sugar versus moderately high blood sugar throughout the day is going to ultimately be roughly the same time under the curve, so to speak. But if I have a big swing, it gives me the opportunity for insulin levels to come back down. And when insulin comes back down and I'm in a deficit, I am in quite the sweet spot to burn fat. So I'm a fan of having a large spike and then coming down, but the operative words are gonna be then come down. If you can't come down because you're insulin resistant and you have issues with that, then you might need to look at a different situation where you don't spike as high. But a healthy individual can spike and come down and then be done with it, right? So it's okay to do that. You just need to be able to understand where you land with things. For the record, a lot of people know that I'm not a fan of snacking. I personally have a belief that the more that we eat, we kind of stand in the way of things. We never give ourselves hormonally a chance to tap into fat. We could lose body weight, but we might stand in the way of losing fat, right? It's somewhat problematic. So having little breaks between meals is a good thing. I put a link down below for Thrive Market, which is an online grocery store. They are a sponsor on this channel. It's good to have snacks that are at least healthy, right? So they have options where you can choose sugar-free, you can choose keto, low-carb, Mediterranean. So that link in the bottom, that gets you 30% off your entire grocery order. So your entire first grocery order, the link is in the top line of the description underneath this video, and it also gets you a free $60 gift with your first order. It is a game changer, it gets delivered to your doorstep, you don't have to go to the grocery store anymore, it makes life easy, plus they have meat and seafood as well. So that link is in the top line of the description. 29,405 people. Huge study published in Nutrients that was looking at meal timing. They took 21 meals per week as the average. Okay, they found that those that consumed 16 to 20 meals per week had a 20% less risk of developing insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes than the 21 per week. Those that consumed 14 or 15 meals per week, 30% less risk of developing insulin resistance or type 2 diabetes. And this is not something where they put them in an RCT and we're saying, we need you to force yourself to eat two meals per day or else. No, this is looking at data and saying casually, the people that eat two meals versus three meals have lower risk of diabetes. We forget how much of a role inflammation plays. And part of it is how much it's downplayed in the evidence-based community sometimes. And I'm an evidence-based guy, so I can say this, right? Sometimes we say, Inflammation is overblown, and it is, except when you have a metabolic condition or dysfunction, which unfortunately is a lot of people. A lot of people have a metabolic condition, our diabetes or insulin resistant, whatever. So we are talking to a large cohort here that is having an issue because most people that do have diabetes also are dealing with inflammation issues. I'm gonna read you an excerpt from a study published in Nutrients and it's quite interesting. A regular meal pattern, including breakfast consumption, consuming a high proportion of energy early in the day, reduced meal frequency, 
and regular fasting periods may provide physiological benefits such as reduced inflammation, improved circadian rhythm, increased autophagy and stress resilience, and modulation of the gut microbiota. Having gaps in between meals seem to have these huge improvements on inflammation and all these things that are metabolic, right? I think we forget how important it is. There's a new study that came out in 2024 that I'm gonna reference that really helps us understand a lot of this. Okay, and it was published in Cell Reports. And essentially it found that during a fasting period, inflammation was lower, which is not really much of a surprise. And arachidonic acid levels are higher. Basically what they found in this study in rodents is that arachidonic acid levels, when these go up, we end up actually having an inflammation quelling effect that blunts something called the NLRP3 inflammasome. This is something that is like governs inflammation within the body. And when it's quelled, inflammation is attenuated. It's no new news that fasting temporarily lowers inflammation, like while you're fasting. But what this study is suggesting is that by not ever taking a break from food, we're consistently top upping, if that's a word, inflammation. We're never letting it come down. So we know that fasting brings it down, and we know that when you eat, it's gonna come back up a little bit. But if you can consistently quell it by having lower food intake and having longer gaps between meals, it's harder to rebound up. You're gonna have acute rebounds, but since it actually lowers it at like a governor level of the NLRP3 inflammasome, having period of time between meals is reducing inflammation enough to give you a little bit of slack so that your body can recover. Lower inflammation will mean better insulin sensitivity. That is not marketing BS. Lower levels of inflammation will make it easier to lose fat. That is not marketing BS, okay? So how do we go about reducing inflammation? Well, since we do see that fasting periods and having gaps between meals lowers it during that time, perhaps simply by sheer volume of doing that consistently, you lower inflammation. So there's a reason why people that take long breaks between meals swear by it, because they feel good. Maybe they're less inflamed. There's a reason that eating eight meals per day, even when the calories are the same, a lot of times make people feel sluggish, even though their appetite may be controlled. So you're probably looking for my overall answer on this. If I had to give you the perfect number, I would say three meals per day as a baseline. 45% of your calories in the morning, 35% at lunch, 20% at dinner, and then a few days per week, do two meals per day. And do those two meals per day where you're having breakfast and lunch if you can. That way you're skipping dinner and you're just kind of having a consolidation there. But even if you do lunch and dinner, it's fine too. Because remember, two meals per day seem to be really good for waist circumference. Three meals per day seems to be good for appetite control. As always, keep it locked to hear my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.